And thank you for all of you who are joining us online. We're thrilled that you're part of our day today. So we're in a series called Being the Church. And uh, what we're discovering is you might get bored with going to church. You will never get bored with being the church. We're in Acts chapter 6. We're spending time in Acts. We're going about a chapter a week. We'll be in Acts chapter 6 beginning in verse 1. In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained that against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom, and we will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Uh, let's start with this this morning. Having a problem doesn't make you a problem. People really aren't our problems. People have challenges, there are circumstances that we have to find solutions for or a pathway forward in. But often we struggle with identifying what a problem is. In fact, here's something I don't recommend you ever do, okay? It happens all the time, but I don't recommend that you do it. It's when you walk into a situation where there's some frustration, something's not right, and you look at somebody square in the eye and you say these words, what's your problem? Very few people respond well to that. Uh, so what's a better response? Well, what is a problem? And a problem really is the distance between reality and what someone was expecting to happen. Okay? So if you come home and you expected dinner to be ready, and it's not ready, you might be frustrated. If you come home and the lawn is not mowed, if you come home and the driveway is not shoveled, not that that's going to happen this year. Uh, with, with global warming and everything, I think we're, we're going to scale through this. Wouldn't that be nice? No. Uh, so rather than asking what's your problem, a better question is, what were you expecting? Ah, that's really important information. Problems actually demand a lot from us. They're, they cause a lot of fatigue, and they can be the source of a fair amount of frustration. And some problems in our life are the result of some unwise choices we have made. We don't always get it right every time. But some problems are not a matter of choosing wrongly. Sometimes we just live in a complicated world, and, and, and we're imperfect people. And so that can create a set of challenges. The, the, what we usually do, though, is when we're experiencing a problem, we don't like to talk about it with other people, unless we're complaining. And we usually feel like there's something wrong with us. Maybe it's even God punishing us, because now I have this problem. So what we're going to see today is that God's wisdom can help you avoid some problems in life, but even more importantly, can help you solve problems in life. That's a really big deal. The church in Acts had problems. Um, they, that didn't mean that they were going to run away from these problems or deny these problems. Rather, they decided to lean into them and find solutions for them. And this is important for you to know. No church is perfect, not even the one in Acts. No church is perfect. If you came here thinking this was a perfect church, when we get to the end of the service and everybody bows their head and closes their eyes for prayer, just run then. Nearest exit. Get out. We're not perfect. And there are no perfect people. Imperfect churches and imperfect uh, people always face problems. 
Now, the problem that was being faced in the church in Jerusalem is really interesting given the, the context of our own culture. It was a charge of discrimination. There were Hellenistic Jews who were not receiving the same resources that the Hebraic Jews were receiving. And uh, if, you, if you know some of the history about that, um, there were Hellenistic Jews. These are Greek Jews, and they spoke Greek. Now, almost all Jewish people at this time, because of the political realities in the world, spoke Greek. So even if you were raised in Israel and, and you were raised in, uh, to know Hebrew and your, your native tongue there would be uh, uh, Aramaic, you would still know some Greek. The, the challenge for the Hellenistic, the Greek Jewish people, is that they only knew Greek. So when the church would come together, this could create some communication problems. And, um, and the Hellenistic Jew, Jewish widows were missing out on some of the available resources. Now, the church had had great preaching, and the church had incredible miracles, and this is the surprise. Are you ready? Great preaching and great miracles are not enough. If we just had better preaching, nope. If we just had more miracles, nope. We also need good administration. And I know there are some people who just go, no, no, that's, we need to be led by the Spirit. This passage tells us we need good administrations. When problem are, problems are not solved, people will not be well served. That's what happens. We have to find solutions to these. People will feel like they're second-class citizen. If you were a widow in that day, it meant that you had lost your identity and your standing in society. Women in that time were not allowed, for the most part, to own property. So they either had to have another family relative who would take over, and then they would subject their lives to them, or they would lose everything. Like This happened frequently in the ancient world. And not only that, but some of them, because they had put their faith in Jesus, actually found themselves disowned by their family. So they may have been kicked out by their family and now they're being left out by the church. You can see how devastating this was for them. So there's an opportunity to, to clarify the priorities of the church. And that's what growth really does. And so they're going to transfer authority. The apostles are going to hand off responsibility, but the authority that goes with it. They're, the apostles are not saying we're too preoccupied to deal with issues like widows or poor people in the church. They are dealing with it. The church has to learn to do things in a way where everything is addressed, not just the things that the leadership is good at. Everything has to be addressed. That means that things that I'm not good at, I have a responsibility to identify people who are and raise them up and release to them ministry and authority so they can fulfill that responsibility. So Stephen and Philip are two names that are mentioned. They wind up being key players in ministry realities in the church. And Antioch is a place that's mentioned. One of the strongest churches in the ancient world actually comes out of Antioch. In fact, it's, it's the place where, where Christians were first called Christian. By the way, it's also a place where uh, all kinds of uh, uh, ethnic diversity lines were crossed and people came together in the name of Jesus. So growing churches require growing people. Growing churches require growing people. Uh, this is an important thing for us to know because we all know we need to be forgiven. Like, that's the message of the gospel, right? We're imperfect people. We can't pay the price for our own faults and failures. Jesus paid that price for us, so we need to be forgiven. We all know that. But there's also a call to grow. Forgiving is good, but so is growing. And here's the challenge. Growth requires you taking personal responsibility. No one can make you grow. It's not possible. They can create opportunities. They can create environments, but they can't make you do something. And, and if we're going to grow, that is going to require some capacity for problem solving. So in case you think that this message is just about how can the church be better administrated, every one of us have problems in our life. Every one of us can grow in our capacity to solve those problems. And that's why this passage is so incredibly important to us.
will never increase our influence for the gospel and for the grace of God in our culture unless we also grow in our depth of understanding. Good administration is actually how we move towards fulfilling mission. There's nothing more frustrating in the world than to have a clear vision of what could be and never being able to take steps towards it. Good administration helps us move in that direction. So there was some prejudice going on. So what is prejudice? And if I were to ask you here today, and how many here will stand up and admit, don't do this by the way, stand up and just acknowledge today you are a prejudiced person. I'm guessing it'd be a very small number. And here's what I want you to know. Every one of us could stand up here. Every one of us say, no, no, no. I, I know what my heart is towards certain groups of people. Nope. Prejudice is not about harshness and it's not about hatred. Prejudice comes from two words, prejudge. It just means you make an assumption about a person, about a group, or about a situation before you have the information. That's what prejudice is. You're prejudging. We don't take the time to listen. And we don't have to be angry. We don't have to be harsh. We don't have to be hurtful. But prejudging that individual, that group, that situation is prejudice. And so... We need to learn how to deal with these things. Prejudice is something that we have to, the, the best way to fix prejudice is to close your mouth and open your ears. That's how we can do it. So solving systemic problems requires creating a system. Anything can happen by accident, that's once. If it happens twice, it's a pattern. And the challenge is, is, for lots of us, we have things that keep cropping up in our lives, and we don't really have a system for dealing with that, so it requires the same amount of energy and effort every single time it comes up, and that will frustrate us over time. So what God wants to do is to give us wisdom so that we can put guidelines and systems in our life so that those things are addressed without us constantly being surprised by them or having to come up with new solutions for them. So church leaders identified two attributes. These are the two things that we need in order to be really good problem solvers. And the first is you need to be filled with the Spirit, people who are full of the Spirit. So what does that mean? And first thing it means is that you have an ongoing capacity to be renewed and refreshed in your life. You don't just run on empty that you haven't allowed the busyness and the demands of everyday life to choke out life. You have time for God because he's the source of our life. God is not a task that we complete, he's the source of life that we go to. We operate from fullness rather than from fear or frustration. How many times do we respond to things when we're just ticked off? Or we respond to something because we're very anxious? And what God wants us to do is to respond to things out of the fullness that is in us, which is a very different kind of response. So a personal frustration. We all have pet peeves, right? No? Let's see, how many have pet peeves? How many of your pet peeve is when the pastor asks you to raise your hand in a <laughs> church? No. Pet peeves. And we all have personal preferences. And we will approach a lot of life by trying to stop the things that annoy us and get things the way we want. And that is not a great way to live life. As it turns out, when all we do is live out of our frustration and try to get our way, we don't solve problems, we create more of them. So, we need to be full of the Spirit. And full of the Spirit also means this. It has to do with passion. And you can tell when somebody has passion for something, right? And it's not just because they're loud or they're moving quickly. Passion is more than energy. There is energy involved, but it flows out of love. When you love God, life flows into you. When you love others, life flows from you. You have the kind of energy to deal with the issues that's required of you. So we want to be full of the Spirit. And we also, the second thing is to be full of wisdom. This isn't about IQ. This isn't about your GPA in school. This isn't about how much education you got. I'm, I'm a big fan of education. I think you should get all that you possibly can. But this isn't about how smart you think you are. Wisdom has to do with experience, things that you've learned 
both by successes and failures in life. And by the way, it can be not only your personal experience, but experience you've learned from watching other people succeed and fail. You don't have to pay every price for all the failures. You can watch what somebody else does and say, it didn't seem to work so good for them. Maybe I shouldn't do it. It can be, uh, uh, wisdom also includes insight. What are the contributing factors that aren't obvious? Just something a little bit under the surface. And if I take time to think about it for a little bit, I'll learn something I didn't know before. And, the, and, and just good sense, good sense, pragmatic approach to taking steps forward. That's a wise person. So God is looking for people that are full of the Spirit and operate in wisdom, and God desires you to be that person. These are not competing realities. I, I talk to people sometimes, and one of their favorite verses of Scripture in the Bible is this. The wisdom of God is foolishness to men. Yes, but the foolishness of men is not the wisdom of God. It's not the same thing. I get that we don't understand everything that God does, but just doing foolish things and, and hoping God fixes it supernaturally for us is not the wisdom of God. These are actually complementary things. To be filled with the Spirit and walk in wisdom work really well together. So when we find solutions to our problems, these are some, some things that happen. Others don't feel left out. It's amazing how many people feel left out of, of the church in general just because the church has problems that they either haven't identified or they haven't found a solution yet. When, when, when people solve problems, ministries are raised up. There's a lot of potential that was released. In fact, Stephen and, and Philip become key players in the church's history. Ministries are raised up, and God's kingdom expands. See, this is what it would have been easy for the apostles to do. They could have said this. Remember that day when, when the Holy Spirit came? How many of there were, were us? They said 120. How many do we have now in the church? About 15,000. Yeah, that's too many. But we need to go back. Listen, it was easier in terms of complexity when there's 120, but that's not better. And when the church solved this problem, the Bible says that many disciples were added rapidly to the church and a number of priests believed in the word. People who've been raised up in religious environments and trapped by a set of assumptions that wouldn't let them actually solve problems, when they saw the wisdom of God released, they said, yep, I can sign on to that. The money goes where it's supposed to go. People are served the way they're supposed to be served. One group is not over another group. It was a really powerful witness in the community. So things to avoid when facing problems. Don't respond in anger, all right? Anger can actually motivate you to take action, but anger can also motivate you to rant. So here's what I want you to know. If you're ranting, you're not taking action. It's not the same thing. Not the same thing. Don't respond in anger. Don't run away from the problem. And try to avoid managing the problem on your own. So how can we solve problems? This is where it gets really practical today, okay? You ready? I can wait. You ready? Okay, good. Number one, identify the problem as clearly as you can. What is the problem? Remember, go back and, and ask that question, what was I expecting? That really helps a lot. And what are some things that might be contributing to this? Really helpful information to have. Secondly, commit your problem to the Lord. Bring it to his attention, but don't just complain about it. There's a word in the Bible that's used, and we've used it in our culture too. It's called murmur. Has anybody here ever heard that word? And, and how many, murmur is like the perfect word to describe what people do when they're complaining. Just say it like three times the other, murmur, murmur, murmur. That sounds like them, right? That's what they're doing. And in fact, it's not just telling you something once, it's telling you something again, which is why the word is mur, mur. It, it, it repeats itself. Like you can't just say it once and be done with it. You gotta keep going with it. And, and so when you come to God, it's all right to tell him what your challenges are and what you're frustrated by and what you're afraid of, but then pause and listen. And it's amazing the things he will bring to your heart and mind if we'll just pause and listen. Uh, number next. Uh, by the way, uh, when, um, where am I here? Commit your problems to the Lord, all right? Identify people in your life who could help you with these problems too. 
Don't just look for people who agree with you. If you're just looking for people who take your side, you won't make any progress. Okay. Uh, three, consider possible solutions in the light of Scripture. Being knowledgeable of Scripture is a huge asset. And that's why we teach from Scripture. My opinions while we gather here are not significant and won't help you live your life in a way that, that allows the grace of God to saturate it and flow through it. But God's Word does. And there are ways for us to access God's Word on a regular basis. And the more familiar you are with God's Word, the more you'll have a sense of God's will. You'll have a, a source of strength and peace that flow into your life. Right, number four, consider the consequences for each option and the consequences for inaction. This is one of the calculations people don't make. What happens if I do nothing? Something happens when we do nothing. We often don't think about that. And what I can tell you is you may have five options and all of them have some consequences. That's all right. Um, it's not about avoiding consequences. It's about trying to solve a problem. Uh, number five, choose one of those options and act on it. This is where we get stuck. We get paralyzed because we've got multiple options in front of us. So we just pause. But choose one and act on it. And then lastly, evaluate the results of your solution. Make some adjustments if you need to. Why is this important? Because the challenges that you are facing in your life might be your biggest learning opportunity. It might be the thing that actually releases even more of the resources of heaven into your life. It might be the very thing that deepens and strengthens your understanding of God. It might be the thing that makes you more of what God intends you to be. What if you allowed your problem to move you towards God rather than from him? What if you allowed God's problem to make his resources available to you rather than assuming he's withholding them from you? What if a problem was actually your opportunity to be renewed and refreshed? I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. And uh, let's just bow our heads for a moment. And you can ask yourself a couple of questions right now. I would like you to just take a moment and identify a problem in your life. So, well, I'm not sure I have any. So just, just think about, is there something in your life that tends to be at least a low-grade frustration to you or produce a low-grade anxiety? Maybe it's a lot more than that. And the question I have for you is, have you brought that to God? And have you asked him for his help in solving it? The easiest thing in the world is to assume that the wisdom of God is all about avoiding the problems of life. And what I want you to know is the wisdom of God helps us solve the problems in life. And would you please hear me? Our world is in desperate need of problem solvers. We've, we're, we're filled to the back teeth with problem blamers and problem accusers. There's no shortage of people who are willing to point fingers. But the grace of God comes into our life to help us find a solution. And when that happens, potential is realized people are raised up and released into the things God has called them to do, and the kingdom of God expands. So I'm going to ask everyone to stand this morning. And I'm going to ask that you just imagine whatever your problem is you're holding in your hand right now, and just, just hold your hand out. And maybe you've got lots of problems, and use both hands. You know, it's okay. Just hold it in your hand, and let's offer it to the Lord, not just to release it, but to receive the solutions he has for it. In Jesus' name, we look to you, Father, for wisdom. Pour love into us that allows us to care about the people who are affected by this. Pour your energy into us, not just so that we get work done, but that it flows out of that deep devotion for you and our connection with others. And help us take steps 
that release your wisdom into our life and into our world. In Jesus' name, amen.